Okay, so welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. I'm lucky enough that over the last weekend I was talking to Gavin Norman of Necrotic Gnome on his company Discord server and he's allowed me into the playtest group for the forthcoming Dolmenwood campaign books. Now, unfortunately, I've not really got time to run like another massive game. However, inspired by Mike, aka Chicago Wizards podcast, where he talks about doing a bit of one-on-one gaming with his significant other, I decided to ask Hannah whether she'd be interested in doing a bit of one-on-one gaming with me. Since we don't get to actually play a lot of games together, do we? Love we games. don't really. I mean, we're doing not like scum and villainy at the moment. We are. That's really about it. And that's the first that, game we've done for ages. Yeah, apart from LARPing, and we're not even in the same groups at that. So yeah. Well, and obviously Four or five that's years not going on since at the minute, we've done it? a regular so. game together. Yeah, so <laughs> I thought it'd be nice, you know, especially at the minute where like a lot of people are sort of indoors, you know, looking looking stuff to do. I thought it'd be nice to do a bit of one-on-one gaming. So it's something a bit different for me because I don't know that I've ever actually run a sort of one-on-one game before. Uh, it'll allow me to test out the Dolmenwood playtest stuff. Me and Hannah can actually do some gaming together, and because obviously we both live together, we can do like an hour or two of the game whenever we whenever we want to basically we don't have to do like a big session or go through all the rigmarole of organizing people or whatever that's it we're both in we've got an hour let's do a chapter of that exactly game. yeah and because the only thing we really need is like something to do when we run out of horror movies yeah exactly which is regularly but um I- i'm just going to keep my, no- my notes in a little notebook which should be fairly easy we've got your character sheet i can fold that up put it inside the notebook we've got everything we need yeah right there there's no messing about now Handily, Gavin has. I've decided to set it in the the Dolman Wood, which is this uh, this sort of fairy tale forest setting published by Necrotic No. It was previously published in a series of zines called the Wormskin Zines, and I believe they're still available until the, the actual new campaign book comes out. But uh, Gavin Norman rightly realised that the zine format's not ideal for running a setting, since once it got beyond a certain amount of information. It can be quite a hassle flicking between all the different zines and whatever. So he's he's adopting the the classic trio format of like player book, GM book and monster manual, but doing it for the Dolman Wood setting. And he's kindly sent me some PDFs of the playtest material. So I'm looking at the Dolman Wood Players Book version six PDF at the minute, and I'm gonna give you a a bit of a sort of brief description of the background in a minute. Then myself and Hannah are going to go through creating a an old school essentials character for her for use in this Dolmenwood game. Okay, so the book describes Dolmenwood as the forest of Dolmenwood lies in the little frequented northern reaches of the kingdom, under the rule of the Duchy of Brackenwald. Though mortals with their towns, towers, and cathedrals now claim dominion over these stretches of tangled woods, fungus encrusted glades more mushrooms in OSR, (laughs) and fetid marsh. Other powers held sway here in ancient times, and some would say remain the true masters of the realm. Within Dolmenwood, the magical and otherworldly are always close at hand, rings of standing stones, looming glades, hallowed by pagan cults of yesteryear. The energy of ley lines pulses beneath the earth, tapped by those in possession of the requisite secrets. Portals to the perilous realm of fairy allow transit between worlds for those charmed or fated by the lords of Elfland. Even the herbs, plants and fungi of Dolmenwood have grown in odd directions, absorbing the magic which infuses the place. Some say that the waters are enchanted, some say the stones and earth are too. And that's just a little bit, a little couple of snippets from the the start of the current playtest book. But essentially it's a, it's like a fairy tale sort of setting that was once occupied by a, a, a fey winter prince mm-hmm. and a a group of sort of mortal factions united to use the power of these standing stones to, to banish this like winter fey. And now there's, there's a few fey remnants, but it's a bit more sort of like mortal held in this forest. And part of the idea of this campaign is that you can just you can like parachute it into any other setting really, because it's just like a big forest and everything outside that's quite vague. So any any campaign where you can have a big forest, you can just be like, it's the Dolmen Wood. That explains why it was sort of invoking so many different sort yeah. of 
things that I w I'd heard of. Uh, as you were reading the description, I was thinking, oh, yeah, so it's a bit like uh, the wood around the lamppost in Narnia. Yeah, exactly. But it's also a bit the wood between the worlds in The Magician's Nephew. Yeah, I But it's I, also a bit Ram Tops from Terry Pratchett and a bit like Hans Christian Andersen and a bit yeah, of... Yeah, I, I very much get the feeling it, it's, meant, it's meant to be a setting that, like you say, evokes all of those sort of mythic, like, forests, but puts a little bit of its own spin on it. And so, in terms of uh, creating a character, so obviously one of the, since it's old school D&D, old school essentials, one of the first things to consider is character class. Now, the, the default classes in Dolman Wood are Cleric, Elf, Fighter, Friar, Grimalkin, Hunter, Knight, Magic User, Moss Dwarf, Thief or Wood Group. Now, you did mention cat people, and my ears did prick up at the name Grimalkin. Indeed. Mercur <laughs> they, they are described in the book as mercurial feline shapeshifters native to the fairy realm. Right, yeah. Got to be the cat people. I like cat people. Okay, so in your class, write down Grimalkin. Okay, now the next thing you're going to need some dice for, I know you had some down here. Sixes. So you're going to need to roll 3d6 to determine each of your ability scores. Oh, give me a second. Yeah. Okay. So how did you do it then? So what happens if you get a triple one? What one of your ability scores is unfortunately low, I believe. Because <laughs> I got a one and a seven. Okay. An eight. So a three seven so my highest score is 14 my lowest is three all right let's have a look at your list of scores then yeah you can re-roll them <laughs> i was gonna say i played enough D, &D it, to know it, that's it not a playable character it, well it is playable but it does give an option there it says if you roll a character with very poor ability scores across the board the gm might let you re-roll them so re-roll all of them and while hannah's adding that up i'll give you a quick description of the grimalkin most Grimalkin who enter the mortal world take to a life of wandering and adventure. They tend to be mercurial, sneaky, self-indulgent and loose with their money. The appearance and form of a Grimalkin is subject to change over time as it shifts between three forms. And these are the three forms you can adopt. Chester, a stupid cat form. You resemble a fat domestic cat in all aspects and only retain a dull-witted intelligence. They can understand languages but cannot respond. Being in Chester is quite embarrassing to a Grimalkin and something they'll normally try to avoid. Mm -hmm. Estre is the cunning humanoid form between three and four foot in height. They wear clothing, speak, walk upright and have delicate hand-like forepaws. It's by all appearances a human cat with fur covering its body. And the last one is Wilder, a primal fey form. They appear as a gleaming pair of deranged predatory eyes. Those who can see in the darkness or perceive the invisible discern a bulky feline form, three foot high at the shoulder, with a bulky head, a leering mouth, and fur standing on end as if electrified. Grimalkin PCs begin in S straight form, the humanoid cat form, and certain things can cause you to change into the others. You don't have to write all this down. So I'm just making a note of those three because that would probably be right. Okay, so. Stick your uh, your ability scores down. Let me know when you've decided what you've got. Like right. say, you need intelligence at least nine. And presumably that means intelligence is going to be my primary stat. No, your prime requisite is dexterity. Dex. Get your scores written yep. down. Okay, so what have you got in strength? Eight. Okay, so that means you have a... I'm going to give you like the modifiers that go with it. Mm -hmm. So you have a minus one in melee... All right. How many modifiers are there for strength? There's just a minus one for melee, and then it determines what your open doors chances, which should be listed on there under open doors. So if you get to like a door and it's stuck or whatever, you roll a d6. If you get a one, you bust it open. Cool. Okay, so what's your intelligence? Twelve. Okay, so that means you only speak one language, your native language. However, you are literate. Okay. What's your dex? 13. Did you mean to miss wisdom? 
I know I'm just going so down the Mazzi in here. Different order on here. Okay. So with deck with your Dex 13, you get plus one to your AC. Okay. You get plus one to missile like ranged attacks, and plus one to initiative. Okay. okay and what's your charisma? Uh, nine. Okay. So there's no modifier for NPC reactions. Okay. The maximum number of retainers you can have is four. And the default loyalty of any retainers you hire will be seven. Okay. Okay, what's your wisdom? Wisdom, 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 five. Okay, so you get a minus two on magic saves. Okay. Uh, that leaves calm. Yep. Which determines hit points, and that's a nine. So you get no modifier to your hit points. And what did you say your dex was, since that's your prime requisite? 13. Okay, so when you get XP, you will gain an additional plus 5%. Mm. You should write that down any way you want. Okay, so we've got the abilities written down. So the next thing is to choose your class, which obviously you've already done. It's Grimalkin. We're starting you at level 1, so you have 1d6 as your hit points. I always give maximum at first level so you get six. <laughs> okay, so your base attack bonus is plus zero. Plus zero. Right, and then the melee was minus one and the missile was plus one. So you've got a plus one for missile, minus one for melee. Yeah. Actually that's not bad for a first level character. Anything Okay now there probably won't be a space for this because this is like a Dolmen Ward specific thing. Yeah. So you might have to write it in the notes section. But you get a glamour, which is like a sort of fey magic. And you get one of those, but we'll go into like those in a bit. So I just write one glamour in like your notes section. Okay, yeah. you have a 20% chance of picking blocks, which will probably be somewhere near your open doors thing. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to read out your saving throws. There should be five of them. Okay, so your death save is 11, your wand save is 12, your paralysis is 14, your next one is 16. That's breath. Yep, and spell is 15. Okay, so I'm going to give you some other tidbits about your character. Like I say, you may have to write these in the notes section on the back because they're like Dolmord specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. The three different forms we talked about earlier, yep. I'll go into in a little bit. However, you are effectively immortal. Okay. You can be killed, but you don't age and die naturally. Okay. You're immune to mundane illnesses, like entirely, but you can be affected by magical diseases. Also, which would be quite handy if you ever get lost in the woodland, you can't die of thirst or starvation. Yeah. Well, that Presumably apparently. that means you can still suffer the effects of the... Well, it, it does say a lack of sustenance them. drives them insane and sadistic, so you know it die, but you're not going to have a pleasant time. Okay. Now, the, the, this next is like a, a special ability you have, which I think is by far the coolest thing about this class. It's called rat catching. Now, okay. like all of like all of cat kind, Grimalkin delight in catching and consuming rodents. But the thing I like about it is, because it's like a fey thing, it gives you like an ability... So consuming a rodent, whatever size, takes one turn. So if you come across a giant rat, it still only takes you one turn to eat. You're like, oh! Once you eat a rodent, your current hit points are increased by the hit dice of the consumed rodent. And you can even go above your normal maximum because of that. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you're in your estray form, which is the default one, you know, humanoid cat... Yeah. And you do this, there is a one in eight chance each time you do this, you'll transform into your Chester form and you'll become more like a normal cat because you're doing like normal cat stuff. Okay, so am I not able to switch between those forms? Only under, will? only under, no, only under certain right, circumstances, okay. but um, we'll go into that in a little bit anyway. Hang on, hang on. <coughs> I still have all the extra hit points, right? Yeah, okay. One other handy thing is. When you have hit points above your maximum, by consuming rodents, yeah. 
you can sacrifice one or more of the extra hit points to spew up a hairball. Okay. It takes one round of going uh, 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 okay. before you can do it. However, okay. all creatures in a 30 foot line are bombarded by fur balls and so for 1d6 right. damage. It's like a breath weapon. Uh, one, one, oh, it's 1d6 per sacrificed hit point. Okay, let me just just pause for a moment yeah, yeah. and let I'll, me write I'll pause this down reflect. because this is fucking complicated. Now, it's interesting you say it's complicated because I was saying to um, Gavin on when we are talking about this that my only dispute between this class, which I think is quite interesting, it does seem quite a lot more complicated than the others. I don't know that it is actually more complicated than the others. It's just that there's a lot of conditions there and I want to write them all down. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so the next thing is silver sickness. If you come into contact with mortal silver, because you're a fake creature, you have to make a constitution check to avoid sneezing and slimy tears for 1d3 days. You also suffer double damage from iron weapons. Right, hang on, that's silver sickness. What page number is that on? 34. Okay. Um, double damage from iron. Yep. Because I'm a fairy. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, okay, so the next thing is there's certain things you can or can't do in your three different forms. So I'm going to give you those like in a very basic way. And there's also like a condition that allows you to transform into the three forms. Okay. So, okay, so Chester form. Mm -hmm. In combat, you can make a bite and two claw attacks each round. However, each one only does one point of damage. Do you mind if I just get a look at how this is laid out on there? Because it's going to be in my head, and if I don't write it anyway, where I can understand a bit no, better. Okay, next thing after the attacks for the Chester. Sorry. Okay. So when you're in Chester form, you transform into Estray form at dawn, unless you want to stay in Chester form. So basically, if you get put into Chester form, you've got to spend at least like a day until the next dawn in it, and then after then you can change back at time you want. Okay. Okay, so Estray form, the Puss in Boots form, you can wield any small weapon, you can wear any type of armor, Although it's got to be custom made for your size. And you can use shields. If you're, if you're in combat with anything larger than human, you get plus two AC. Because you're like too small and you can zip around it. But not including anything that's human or human size, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. No, it's got to be larger than human. Okay, the next thing is glamours. So in Estray form, you're able to make use of a number of minor magical abilities known as Glamours. The number of Glamours is determined by the level and selected at random. So Okay, so I had one Glamour. Yeah, so I may as well select that at random now. I'm just going to go okay. to the appropriate page. Well, that give me a minute to take a swig of this then. Yeah. Okay, so would you like to roll me a d20? Yep, I've got your big one here. It'll make a nice noise on the floor and everything. It's a five. Five, okay. So you have got the fairy glamour called Cheer or Discord. Cheer as in... Yeah. So, when you're speaking to a group of mortals, you can impart a subtle sense of cheeriness or of creeping dread, Discord. The longer you speak and the mortals are listening to you, the more pronounced the feeling gets. So after one turn of you talking, one hit dice of mortals per level are strongly affected. Lovely. <laughs> okay, and you can use that as many times as you want. It's just like an innate power. It's like yeah. a, a little like cantrippy sort of deal here. I don't have any notes under Wilder form yet. No, that's fine. Okay, so still for your for your Estray form. Yeah. Okay, so when you're in Estray form, you can transform into Chester form at will. It takes D6 rounds. 
56 rounds. Yep. So it's not exactly uh, a handy escape route, is it? Oh, wow. Well. I don't know, rounds only six seconds, so. 36 seconds, potentially. Anyway. Okay, <laughs> if you want to change into wilder form, yeah. if you're in battle and near death, so less than one third of your total hit points, you can change into wilder form, and that takes one round. If less than, right, yeah, makes sense, I suppose. One third total HP can change to wilder. Okay, so for your wilder form, mm -hmm. so you can't wield tools or weapons, however, you can make a bite and two claw attacks each round. Each of these does d4 damage and it counts as magical damage. Okay. Okay. If you're in wilder form and you are touched by the rays of the sun, you are transformed into a lump of wood. Okay. A save versus petrification is allowed to resist for each round of exposure. Okay, so what's the next note? Okay, so uh, a Grimalkin in Wilder cannot distinguish friend from foe and will attack all nearby living creatures. Yeah. When combat comes to an end, the Grimalkin will disappear into fairy, coming under the referee's control. Mm -hmm. So when you're in Wilder form, you gain plus two bonus to your attacks and an additional 2d6 hit points. Because you're only semi-visible, people attacking you who can't see invisible stuff get a minus two penalty. Mm. So obviously you only go into this form if you're like getting a real beat down in combat. Well, yeah. And then after the combat's finished, if you've survived, you like you effectively briefly become an NPC and like disappear into fairy. Then after a period of time determined by the referee. We've spent wandering around fairy and chilling out a bit, like brute becoming Bruce Banner mm -hmm. after being the Hulk. You turn back into your astray form, and then you appear in the sort of like the mortal world. So presumably, you're intelligent enough to stay out of the sunshine until then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. That's it for the class. Uh, choose alignment. Decide whether you want to be lawful, neutral, or chaotic. I tend to like a chaotic good, if that's all right with you. If There's only three chaotic. alignments, lawful, neutral, or chaotic. Ah, okay. And okay. let me tell you what the alignments mean. Law, you believe in truth and justice. Neutral beings believe in balance. Chaotic beings are directly opposed to law. Should seldomly be trusted because they tend to act in evil ways and are selfish. Right, so I'm going for law then. Okay. Because I'm a shiny hero. Indeed. Okay, so. Next thing to do is to note down your language. Right, yeah, so your language always includes Waldish, which is the common tongue. And you also automatically speak your alignment language, so lawful. And then you don't get any extras. I'm guessing Grimalkin don't have their own specific yeah, it's called Mule. language. M-E-W-L. Okay, um, do I not get my own species language as default? Yeah, you must or, do, yeah. yeah. Put, I'm put, like, I'd rather take that than put, lawful. Put, put, me, put me all down, <laughs> M-E-W-L. I'm not sure that's 100% right, but no mind. Okay, so your character starts with 3d6 times 10 gold pieces. <laughs> Or, if you wish, as an optional rule, apparently there's a quick equipment thing in here that you can use instead if you prefer. Mm. Go on, tell me what the quick equipment is. All right, let me just quickly go to the page. Okay, so players who wish to reduce the time spent equipping may follow the steps provided below. Bum, bum, bum. The way these so, C6s so have been treated. There's, there's basically a series of roll tables, and you roll on them to see what equipment you've got. Oof, so more roll. <laughs> yeah. Although there's no like bad choices on here, it's just different varieties of equipment. Okay, what dice do I need to roll you'll on? You need a, you'll need a D6. So 
for Grimalkin, roll to see what armor you've got. Five. Okay, so you've got plate mail. Like a little tiny suit of Grimalkin sized plate, plate mail. A sock. Okay, now roll twice to see what weapons you've got. A six. So you've got a short sword. And a four. And a short bow with 20 arrows. Like all sized appropriately for you. Okay. Okay, so you also have the following items a backpack, yeah. a tinder box, yeah. 1d6 torches, so roll a dice. A five. So five torches. You have a water skin. No, you don't have to roll for it, you've just got a water skin. Sorry. Well, sorry, keep that number because that can be how many iron rations you have. Oh, can it? Is that because it's a shit number? I don't know, I can't see what it is. Um, go on. And then you get your 3d6 gold pieces, which you've already rolled for, I think. No, I haven't. Alright, okay. <laughs> One, two, six, nine. That's not too bad, I suppose. Okay. And you also get like two misc items of adventuring gear, and you need a d12 for this. Okay. okay, so roll for your first one. Eleven. You have a sledgehammer. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing with a sledgehammer? Well, that's all up to you. Look to <laughs> weave it seamlessly into the narrative. If I can do it with a fishing rod in Call of Cthulhu, you can do it with a sledgehammer in this. And bear in mind, it is only like a t- tiny, like, bloody um, grimalkin size one. So it's probably more like a toffee hammer. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a giant like, toffee hammer, isn't it? Okay, roll a d12, see what else you get five you get an ink quill and five sheets of paper okay now are you ready for the best bit what random trinket have you got you need a d100 mm. there's a lot of trinkets do the 2d10 88 88 you have a black rose that never wilts. Okay, so we've done the equipment. I think that seemed to work all right. You know, it was, it was a hell of a lot quicker than combing through massive um, loads of equipment. I already feel the need to entirely redesign the character sheet to accommodate the character. That's fine, you can do but, that. But, yeah. You can write it down however you want. This is just so we can get it banged Have down. Have they actually done any for this setting as yet? No, not yet, because we're this still at the early playtest stage. Okay, so your um, your plate mail armour gives mm-hmm. you an AC of 16, like your base AC. Okay, now what weapons have you got? You had a short sword, didn't you? Yes. That does 1d6 damage. Mm. And you had a short bow, didn't you? Yeah. That also does 1d6 damage, but that's two-handed. Okay, that's it stat-wise for your equipment you need. Okay, so you're starting at first level with zero XP. People born in the mortal world, they get to roll what moon sign they were born under and it gives them like a bit of an extra bonus. It's all right, I've got multiple forms. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's why Faye don't get it, because they've got other, other stuff going on. Okay, so would you like to make up a name or would you like to pick one randomly? From my big table of playtest Domwood random Grimalkin names. So... You know where the name Grimalkins come from, don't you? To, to be honest, I probably do, but I cannot think at the minute. So, during the Salem Witch Trials, I think it was, there were two cats that were put on, like, put on trial for witchcraft. Right, okay. One of them was called Grimalkin. The other one was called Piwacket. I'm pretty right. sure Grimalkin was convicted and Piwacket got off. So I'm going to call mine by whack it. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And I think that's pretty much it. The rest of the stuff, you know, just deciding, like, details, like what your character looks like, stuff like that. Cool. And that's all the actual stat stuff done. Yeah, we've got the got the fairy glamour down. Bits and pieces like that. So how did you find that, love? Um, 
Like I said, yeah. I, think, I think personally you've picked one that, of the lengthier classes. <laughs> it's like, if, if you'd have been playing like that, a fighter... That was some it D&D character gen, John. That's what that was. Yeah. Um, obviously, looking at my wisdom score of five, I'm instantly reminded why I always either use 2d6 plus six or uh, some kind of points allocation for player stats. But obviously, with it being a one-on-one game... You've only got one player to tailor your that's encounters it, it, exactly, to. Yeah. I, I've just got to trust you that you're not going to like. Not that I do. Not that I do. Screw me over all the time. Tailor encounters only games. But... <laughs> well, we might have to argue about me re-rolling that wisdom stat later on. So then. It's not going to happen. You've already had one set of <laughs> But yeah, like I say, I think you've um, you've gone for one of the slightly sort of more involved classes. Let's say. Mm. It's like most of the others are like, oh, there's a smattering of abilities and crack on, whereas the Grimalkin one's like, you have three magical forms and here are some abilities. Also, you've got some minor spells. So I was saying to um, Gavin when I was chatting to him on Discord about this, maybe look at like separating them into different like subspecies or trying to find some way of making the forms a bit less. See, I know the like shape changer classes aren't quite so much your bag as they are mine one thing I'm wrong, I, I, love sh- I love shapeshifting no problem. I love shapeshifting if it doesn't involve me having to write an extra three pages worth of text on my character sheet. now I think that it will be very useful when he prints it for him to provide a Grimalkin character sheet that already has most of those notes that I've just had. Well, to I mean, make. what I can do, sweetie, is because um, the um, uh, um, each of the each yeah. of the classes is like a two-page spread in here. So if you mm. want, I can always print you out those two pages yeah. for Grimalkin, and you can just attach them to your character sheet, and then you've got it all there, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And then just give you a bit of a description of the um, the language of the Grimalkin. It's a secret language of Grimalkin and other cat-like fairies. Apparently, mundane cats also talk in that language. So, obviously, you can talk to normal cats. Oh, wow. Although it says that it says that normal cats often seem surprised that they can talk to Grimalkin. So, like I say, mundane cats can also converse in this mm-hmm. tongue, often to their surprise, if addressed and prove eloquent conversationalists. Cat fairies take grave offence at others especially mortals, studying their language and will go to great lengths to prevent knowledge of its sprawling vocabulary and subtle variations of yowl from propagating. Wow. So, I think mean, what we should do there, love, is sort of wrap up here and then maybe we can do another one at some point where we talk about what we want to do in the actual game mm. and then crack on with actually running, run like a sort of Maybe like a test session, do like an hour test session or something. See how we get on. How's that sound to you? Sounds grand. Okay, so we're going to wrap up there, folks. That was us sort of taking a bit of a meandering tour through the character generation in the version 6 playtest version of the Dolmenwood Players Book by Gavin Norman of Necrotic Gnome. We hope you've enjoyed the episode. Until we see you next time, take care. If you want to get in touch with us, you can leave us a voicemail message using SpeakPipe, link in the episode description, or you can leave us an email. The address is rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we see you next time, take care, stay safe, and happy gaming.